So, um, thanks, Kevin. Um, I work for the field service team. I like to call us the traveling roadshow. And we go around to all of our various plants and set up our plants for our customers. So we do drinking water, wastewater plants, and also church tree water plants, which is basically like a third step in the filtration or final step in the filtration after you've clarified water and you want better permeate quality. So anyway, yeah, I go to all different sites, travel around North America, and uh, I'm just going to show you what I've learned over the past little while and hopefully give you a good intro into membrane technology. So we'll start with what is membrane separation. Basically, you have a polymer membrane or a ceramic membrane or some kind of surface that's going to be selective towards the material you're trying to filter. So in my case, it's water. I want water to go through, but I don't want solids to go through. But you can have all sorts of different things. You can restrict salt. You can restrict different ions. You can restrict almost anything, and it depends on the composition of this little square here. So you apply driving force, and depending on the permeability of your membrane, you get a flux through that. So there's three different types of membranes. We have the porous membrane. That's the microfiltration, the ultrafiltration. That's mainly what I deal with. And that's removing solids from water, from wastewater, where we're removing the, the solids, the bacteria that are doing our biodegradation. And in drinking water, we're removing the other various solids we pull from Lake Ontario or our water source. You also have non-porous membranes. Non-porous membranes are very, very dense membranes. They can still be polymers. They can also be ceramics. And they're used to filter things like gases, do things like pervaporation, which is permeate vaporization. So what you do is you actually have a liquid stream on one side, it evaporates, you get a gas permeate, and then you condense that. And that's kind of what you'd find also in RO as well. They're a denser type of membrane. They're a non-porous structure. And you also have carrier membranes here. Carrier membranes are really not very common. Uh, there are examples of carrier membranes, but as far as I know, they're not in industrial practice, or if they are, they've never been particularly successful. And what they do is they actually have a carrier molecule on the inside, and it binds with the solute of interest, and it allows it to move across the membrane. Otherwise, everything else is restricted. So membrane categories, and what we're going to talk about, which is our porous and non-porous membranes, we have microfiltration being the largest of our membrane diameter. And you can see here on the screen that the different things that it might restrict. So we go all the way up to one millimeter, and we come down in the MF region to about 100 nanometers. When we get into UF, that's ultrafiltration versus microfiltration, we actually have smaller pore sizes. So we can get down to almost two nanometers. We go from 10 to two nanometers in terms of size exclusion. And these two things, the MF and the UF, and in a lot of ways, the uh, nanofiltration, they're size exclusion technology. So you have solutes that are a certain size or molecular weight, and we restrict those with the membrane size. Then you get down to our RO and different types of uh, electrical means of separation. We'll, we'll just talk about membranes for now. But our RO, you actually start getting diffusion characteristics and you form a solution in the membrane. So we have mainly convection happening in our NF to UF. And when we get down to RO, you actually have the solute and the solvent sort of dissolving in the membrane structure, and that's how it permeates through. And below about two nanometers, that's when you start needing, in terms of what you're excluding, that's when you need your RO. So in terms of water treatment, this is what we're trying to get rid of. Um, the Ministry of the Environment says we have to exclude cryptosporidium and giardia from our drinking water. So those are the tiniest viruses and, uh, and bacteria that we don't want to get sick on because getting sick on these two things are quite nasty. So that's what we're trying to get rid of. And just to put it into perspective, we also have E. coli as well that we're trying to get rid of. Um, we don't want to have another Walkerton. So we use membranes that are nominally two nanometers in diameter, but they can be smaller. And that's how we restrict all of this from getting into our drinking water supply. In the wastewater stream, we also, we're actually trying to conserve our bacteria because that's what we're putting back into our system to do the biological degradation. So the end point is that we want to keep the bacteria on the, uh, called the reject side of the membrane, and the permeate is just water. So just to summarize here, here are the different uh, types of porous and non-porous membranes. And here are the pressure ranges that you operate them at, as well as what it rejects and the pore size of them. So one thing I'll bring attention to is that microfiltration, ultrafiltration, we're not using a great deal of pressure up to about 10 bar, and even that's getting quite high. But as soon as you get into your reverse osmosis, your non-porous membranes, you get up to quite high pressures, eight times. You get up to about 80 bar. So the reason for that is we have a much 
smaller structure, non-porous structure is a much smaller structure, and we're actually now relying on our diffusion characteristics and the dissolution of our solvent and our solute inside the membrane. And to actually then get that through requires a lot more pressure. And with our ultrafiltration, we're really just relying on convection, so it's quite easy. We have pore sizes, water goes through, solids don't. So because this is an engineering class, I thought I should show you some equations. So we've got uh, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, where our flux is proportional to some permeability coefficient and the pressure difference. When you get into reverse osmosis, however, you now start seeing a difference between the flux of the water or the solvent and the flux of the solute or the salt. So in reverse osmosis, we have to overcome the osmotic pressure of the membrane. So that's like a base threshold that we need to overcome before we can start actually permeating. And then we have our pressure here. So your flux is whatever pressure it takes to overcome your osmotic pressure, and then up to 80 bars. And then the flux of the salt, which does remain constant across the membrane, is proportional to the concentrations. And then you get into more compli complex separations, your per evaporation and your gas separation. That's based on the partial pressures and another experimentally determined permeability coefficient. So dense membranes or RO membranes. So I won't go into too much detail because I, I know that you guys are going to be covering this later. But basically, you can always come back to Fick's Law, so second year chemical engineering. And what we have in this diagram, I'll just walk you through, is we've got our bulk salt, salt concentration, which as it crosses the boundary layer to the actual membrane surface, we start to see a collection of that solute at the membrane surface. We're pulling a pressure, we're forcing it against the membrane. And then you see this drastic decrease in the concentration to the point where we actually don't have very much salt going across the membrane at all. So what you see here is a selective layer. So the selective layer is our dense non-porous membrane. And that's where we're really getting a lot of the restriction from. So that's where we need a lot of the pressure. Now the pressure we need is going to be proportional to the distance of that layer. So what we want to do is make this layer as small as possible so that we get our solute rejection, but we also need structure. So if I made this entire structure, which let's just say for argument's sake, I need that entire block for the structure of my membrane, I'm not going to get a lot of permeability through this because I have this really, really thick layer. So what I do is I put a thin layer here, and then I put a more porous structure to support it over here. So I can create my pressure across this layer, get my solute rejection, and then I get my permeate. So like I was saying before, we've got our, our salt diffusion there, and, uh, and you have salt and water flux. So that's better described in this graph, where here we've got our water flux, proportional to the pressure we apply in PSI, this one. And we've got about 350 is the osmotic pressure we have to overcome in the RO membranes that we produce. And then as you start applying pressure, you start, start to see that you have salt rejection. And one thing to note is that the water flux is proportional to the pressure you apply, but the salt flux stays constant. So the salt flux isn't going to increase because we have that exclusion of the salt from the membrane. So that's going to stay constant through the whole permeation, and the, the water flux is going to increase. So what you see here is that uh, our salt rejection is going to increase as we start diluting the co or concentrating the reject side. And then it's going to reach some constant state once we get to a steady state operation. And that's the sort of the operating band of our RO membrane. So here's the re rejection over here. It's the salt in your feed minus the concentration of it in the permeate divided by the salt in the feed. OK, so we also have our porous membranes. So porous membranes run off of a, a slightly different principle, a much simpler principle, uh, developed by Ferry. So he basically said that the amount of water that's going to go through, oh, my equation didn't come up. That's not good. OK, anyway, he's basically saying that the amount of solute that I get through is going to be proportional to the diameter of my pore, the accessible area of my pore, divided by, uh, or sorry, the solute divided by the pore diameter there. And that's going to give me a curve. Oh, there it is. So that's my restriction right there. That's my reject coefficient here. And it's all proportional to this lambda, which is the diameter of my solute divided by my pore. So what you see here is the basic Fairy equation, where you have it coming up and then going linear right here once we hit 1. So remember that lambda on the bottom and my rejection here, this lambda is equal to the diameter of the solute divided by the diameter of my pore. So when they're equal, I start getting consistent rejection. But it's not a linear function or a step function because as the particles are getting larger and larger, they're actually hitting the outside 
of my pore, so they're, they're bombarding the outside of my pore, and they're not making it through. It's not always a direct shot through the middle of the pore. So you have this sort of this curved relationship here where not all of them are getting rejected until you have basically your particles larger than the amount of uh, accessible area of your pore. The other way that we can characterize a porous membrane is by its molecular weight. So this came out of the biotech industry where when they were trying to separate bacteria or various uh, biological solutes for their purposes, they wanted to know, okay, if I've got a 1,000 kilodalton molecule, what kind of membrane do I want to grab so that I can get that in my permeate side and, uh, and purify it? So that's where molecular weight cutoff comes from. Molecular weight cutoff basically says it's just a definition of a membrane, and it's something you might see on membrane statistics or, or membrane spec sheets. And it's basically saying that uh, when I get 90% rejection, that's my molecular weight cutoff. So if I had molecular weight cutoff of... Uh, 1,000, then that's only 90% of the rejection of that membrane. Um, so here you see sort of the, it's a logarithmic scale. You have it increasing to the point where, again, our pore size is going to be equal to our solute size or the thing we are removing. Okay, so here's some SEM um, electron microscope photos of what the membranes look like. So up here you've got a finger-like structure, and then over here you've got a spongy-like structure. So Basically, these two things can be formed in exactly the same way. So it's all based on what kind of chemistry you're using to produce your membrane and what kind of techniques you're using to then get your polymer to separate into a, a strong, solid piece of, of our membrane. So the finger-like structure comes out of having basically poorly controlled environments. You, don't have, uh, you may have a lot of flux from your polymer solution, which we'll get into later, as it separates into a solid state. Whereas here, we have a very controlled environment, and you get this very uniform distribution of pores in the fiber. So this is bad, this is good. Um, so then, when we have our good membranes, our spongy structures, we've got our asymmetric and our symmetric structures. So you see here, this is actually a cross-section of an RO membrane, and we've got this very, very dense layer on top, and it sort of becomes uniform and spongy-like structure underneath. Whereas here, it might be hard to see on the overhead, but on the outside here, you have this denser layer there. You have this spongy structure that gets bigger and bigger on the inside, and then it gets denser as it goes to the outside again. That's actually a hollow fiber. This being a flat sheet, this is a hollow fiber. So that means that it's got an area on the outside and an area on the inside, and you're seeing a cross-section of that hollow fiber membrane. So it's a tube, basically a straw. Um, and the reason we like this is you get your separation on the outside and on the inside, but you have this great pore structure on the inside providing you with mechanical support, but also, you know, and, and facilitating the filtration across it nice and easy. So you don't have a lot of restriction. If you, if you did have it dense all the way through, you'd have a lot more restriction. You'd need higher pressures to permeate through that membrane. Then we also have ceramic composite membranes, and uh, GE does not make these, to my knowledge. But what you have here is actually three layers. So you've got a very, very um, non-porous, very dense membrane here. Then you've got a less dense membrane there and a more spongy, open porous structure here for the mechanical support. Ceramic membranes are really good in high temperature applications because polymers can't withstand high temperatures. Like above, above about 38, 40 degrees C, you don't really want to take them that high because you start to see some problems and some, uh, some shrinking of the membranes and uh, heat, I guess we'll call it uh, dissipation across the fiber isn't uniform. So we don't want to take it above 40 degrees C, but with our ceramic membranes, you can. But to make these, you actually have to do it in three steps. So you create the first membrane, then you have to center it to the second, and then you have to center it to the third layer as well. And so this is just different types of, uh, of making pores and membranes. So if we have a polymer, you know, what do we actually do to make those pores? Because we could have a dense polymer structure, a porous polymer structure, or no pore, no pore structure at all. So one thing, or one method to make it is this nucleopore microfiltration membrane right here. And what they do is they actually bombard a plastic sheet, a polymer sheet, with electrons, and then they etch it in an etching solution similar to, not exactly, but you imagine how a circuit board is etched, if you're familiar with that. Same kind of thing, we etch in the pores, and that creates channels right the way through. The problem with this guy, and the reason we don't do it with ultrafiltration, is because we can't get a dense enough pore structure, so we don't have enough pores, so we're not getting that kind of uh, bang for a buck in terms of surface area on the membrane surface. If we were to bombard them with too many electrons to create more pores, then we'd start getting overlaps and it, it wouldn't give us that uh, nominal pore diameter we're looking for. The second way to do it 
is uh, by stretching your polymer. So a good example of this is Teflon tape. So Teflon tape is white, but it's actually a stretchy material. So the reason it's white is because you've got these voids from the stretching where the light is scattering, so you can't actually see through it. But if you were to put it in a, a solvent that it's uh, you know, not, not water, some sort of organic nonpolar solvent, where you could actually have it sit in there, that solvent would fill up the pores and you'd be able to see through it. It would become translucent. Uh, but you can't do that with water because it's so hydrophobic. So what you've done is we just stretch this polymer this way, and then we create these pores alongside of it. So you could actually permeate through Teflon tape, but you probably wouldn't get a really good quality water. Uh, and then the third method is what we do, which is face inversion. So I'll get into that right now. So phase inversion, you need some kind of, uh, some kind of dope, some type of uh, solution here. And then you, and that's, that chemistry is going to sort of determine the pore size of the structure. You need a solvent, and you need your polymer solution, or your polymer particles here that you're going to put in solution, and a little bit of water. So you mix those together and you stir them for a fairly long time to get a nice homogeneous solution. We want to dissolve all these pellets. We use PVDF. You can also use polysulfone different types of polymers we can use for membranes. So you dissolve that, all three ingredients, and you get a really sort of an orange goopy mess. It looks quite like this, uh, this dope um, chemical right here. But that takes like 18 to 24 hours to prepare. Uh, so unfortunately, I wasn't able to get it ready in time for you guys. But I think Kevin might have a video he can show you of uh, another one of my colleagues doing that demonstration a couple years ago. So you dissolve these guys together. And then you put it on this casting plate, this glass plate here, and you pour it inside a really anything. This is just sort of a casting pot. You can spill it on this glass plate and use a knife as well, just for demonstration purposes. But what you're going to do is you're going to smear it across the, the glass plate, get a nice thin film, and you're going to immerse it in water. So you create that thin film across. I don't know if you can see the shadow right here. He's created a thin film across there, and now he's going to put it in the water. Now, as soon as he puts it in the water, it's going to separate. It's going to go through a phase inversion. So you dip it in the water, and then next thing you know, it's going to start peeling off of the sheet. So what's happening is the, the polymer that's stuck to the glass starts, uh, the, the solvent actually starts transferring from the polymer into the water solution, and then you don't have enough solvent to now keep that polymer in solution, so it separates, and you get the solid membrane you see here. So that's what it looks like, the cross-section of that membrane. So here's a bit of the science behind it. So if this is your support, your glass plate that we showed in the last picture, and then this is our non-solvent uh, solvent solution, the polymer with the dope and the solvent solution, we use something called NMP, which is miscible in water, as well as uh, able to dissolve the polymer. So because it's miscible in water, as soon as you put that solution or that film inside the water, you start to get a flux just because of diffusion effects from the, the polymer solution into the water. So that NMP solvent solution starts to diffuse into the water, and as it diffuses from the, solvent sol or the polymer solution, it, uh, it actually starts, uh, starts separating because it's no longer able to stay dissolved. So it sort of pops out, and that's why you see that flat sheet happening. And the way we can control the specifics of the membrane pore size, the membrane structure, the asymmetry or the symmetry is based on this flux rate, these two flux rates of water coming in and the NMP solvent going out. So you can imagine that as soon as you put this in the water, the layer that's exposed to the water is going to immediately see some very fast flux of the solvent into the water. But as we get further down here, this is going to take longer and longer and longer until it's no longer going to separate anymore. So that's how you would get sort of a strong structure here and then a more spongy structure down there. So the, the structure of the membrane is dependent on how fast that's going to happen, which is determined by the dope you put in there and, uh, and the composition of the, we just use water but um, for this example, but uh, whatever non-solvent you put up here controls that flux rate and controls your membrane structure. So how do we do that in industry? For a flat sheet, we just use the casting knife like I showed in the photograph of that little uh, sort of stainless bar that we dragged across the glass. So that casting knife is here and you have a constant stream of polymer going in and then it just gets pulled along a conveyor belt through your bath, we'll call it, it's called a coagulation bath, but that solvent bath, and then it comes out as a sheet on the other side. But what we do 
to make our hollow fiber membranes, because GE's business, at least out of the office I work with, is largely with hollow fibers for our UF water filtration, we actually have this setup here, where you've got this sort of casting die that has a needle on the inside. So what's happening is polymer comes through the outside of the die, and then you have this bore liquid, which is uh, just, we'll call it water, but it's our, it's our solvent from the earlier example, goes to the inside, and then through a bath. So you actually have this stream of a, a donut-like stream that's going through the water bath and coming through our pulley system to be, uh, to be coagulated or to be you know, separated and then to be rinsed as well. So that's how we make a hollow fiber structure. We actually pass that, uh, that water solvent on the inside and the outside, and then it coagulates. So different applications of membranes. We've got spiral round membranes, which are fairly common in RO but you can also make uh, any type of membrane this way. And what happens is basically the water is coming across, permeates through the white fiber, and then you have this spacer in between that helps wicks the water into the middle. So your feed goes across here, and then the permeate flow goes along the orange spacer as it's permeated through the white membrane sheet in the middle. So it's actually sealed all on here. So once the membrane permeates through, its only direction of travel is to the inside and then it comes through the inside as your permeate. So here's some, here's like a, a proper spiral round uh, RO membrane, and then here's some of our RO elements. So they would be stacked one after the other in a large pressure vessel to withstand the pressures we talked about earlier. So we also have hollow fiber membranes. So hollow fiber membranes, like I was saying, we have to make a, we make them by passing the, sol the uh, solvent on the inside and the outside and we get these little straw looking things. So they can be in any range of size, but when we're talking about ultrafiltration, we're talking about this kind of size here, 100 to, uh, sorry, 1,000 to 3,000 micrometers in diameter. And here's the pore structure, where the permeate would go from the outside through the pores on the inside and then come out as permeate on the inside. But it could also be the other way. So it really depends on what you're going to use your application for. So there's a couple types as well. You've got tubular membranes where, like I said, you can pass it through uh, the inside and then the permeate can come out the outside or vice versa. You can have the feed on the outside and the permeate coming through on the inside. Then you can also do flat sheet and frames where, like we talked about with the RO, just not spiraled, we can seal the membrane around a spacer sheet and then the permeate can come out the center. And then we would cap it on the top and then you'd, put, you'd stack those in a vessel and you'd have your permeate coming out one side of your vessel. So the main products that I work with are the, we call them Z-Weeds, but it's our UF 500 and our Z-Weed UF 1000 and 1500 products. So the main chemical we use is PVDF, that's our base for the polymer, but like I mentioned, there's, there's other types as well, polysulfone being one of them, but we use PVDF. And our 500 product is a supported product. So the difference between the two, you can sort of see down here, this is a nylon structure on the inside. It's a nylon braid that supports it, so supported structure. And we have an unsupported structure over here. That's our 1000 product. We use them for wastewater, and we use uh, the 500s for wastewater, and we use the 1000s for drinking water. So the reason for that is because we have that nylon braid on the inside, the membranes, the hollow fiber membranes, are actually larger than the 1000 product. And we need to do that and support it with that nylon braid because in a wastewater application, we're going to be bombarding it with tons of solids. Sometimes uh, 1,200 to 1,500 ppm of solids. So we're, going to do, we're doing a really high concentration of solids in our bioreactors, and we're trying to separate all of that biology and all of that dirt, not to mention in wastewater applications, there's usually all sorts of trash that hit them as well. So we're actually trying to support them a little better in the wastewater application. But we can also use these for drinking water. The 1000s are a slimmer product, it's a smaller membrane in overall diameter, and we use those in drinking water because we want to try and get it as dense as possible, we're trying to reduce our footprint. So the big advantage to membranes is footprint reduction in the uh, overall filter uh, system. So we want to try and get these things as densely populated as possible, nice and close together, and we do that by putting way more fibers in here, but also making them a little bit smaller. Now I mentioned we had two types of drinking water fibers, or applications, they're both the same fiber, and they're different in that one is submerged, which is the 1000 product, and the other one is pressurized, which is the 1500 product. So the difference is that we can operate the pressurized product at higher pressure. So with submerged, 
We use the submerged application for drinking and wastewater application. And you have your feed bath in here. Your membranes are submerged inside of it in some sort of supporting structure, which we call a cassette. And it's permeated through the fiber under vacuum and goes this way. So we suck it through the fibers and under vacuum we permeate. When we permeate under vacuum, we can get up to about negative 10, negative 13 PSI, but we don't really want to go above that. We risk damaging and constricting the fibers. So you actually get the fiber is going to start pinching and it's not really going to pass any more water. Under the pressurized application, you can put a lot more force on the outside, up to 40 or 50 PSI, and not risk compressing the fiber. So it's the, just because of its cylindrical shape, we can put more pressure on the outside and permeate through. And like I was saying in the earlier slides, our flux, our water production rate, is dependent on the pressure we apply, our driving force. So if I can pull only negative 10 PSI here, but I can go up to 40 or 50 here, I'm going to get a much higher flux through this product. So I can use less of these modules than I would of these guys to produce the same amount of water. So here's a quick photo of what one uh, wastewater membrane would look like. So they're pretty simple. We have a plastic structure here. Um, lately, we, we have a stainless structure where these are no, not supported in freestanding, but the fibers are actually just uh, potted on one side and capped on this side and capped on this side, and they plug into a larger frame. And we have our unsupported drinking water application. So it's divided into modules that are about this size, or we can use our pressurized, which are this side. Don't worry about that too much. It's just there for demonstration's sake, and I'll show you what the actual system looks like in a minute. So we'll go over what I do on a daily basis and what I work on. So this is actually one of the plants that, or is taken from one of the plants that I'm currently working on in Mississauga. Um, so underneath that water level is eight different, um, eight different membrane cassettes where all, of, all the modules are plugged into them. So they're, they're all separated into these discrete, I don't know, you can't really see it in this photo, I'll keep going. <laughs> So for the submerged products, we take that module that I showed you, we put it into a cassette, and we put the cassette into a tank. And that's how we get our filter train units, by, by putting lots of cassettes, usually about eight in large applications. And in the pressurized products, we take the fiber, it's inside this pressure vessel, potted on both ends, goes into a rack where it's connected for the permeate up here and the feed down there. Feed comes in through a main pipe in here, and permeate leaves through a main pipe up there, and then that goes on to a pumping skid. So with the pressurized systems, we usually just ship skidded systems, but you can also buy them individually. Uh, so here's the plant I'm working on right now, Lakeview, Mississauga, Ontario. So it's a 1,000 product plant, so it's those sort of squarish modules that you saw that plug into the, the stainless cassettes, and they're submerged. So what you see here, just to go over quickly on the bottom, this is the new plant. And this is the, the older plant, so it's actually an expansion. So they have about a 350 million data, liter a day plant already on this site, and they've expanded it to include another 400 million liters per day production of flow uh, on this new site right here. So what you're seeing all the way down here, all these different pipes correspond to the different uh, permeate trains. So when you're doing a water system, you need to have, uh, we'll call it redundancy, but you basically need to have different avenues for flow to go. So that if one's down for repairs, other problems, or cleaning, you still have other ways for that water to be produced. So at Lakeview, on both plants, we divide them into 12 trains. So we've got water coming into the plant from upstream uh, treatment. So pre-treatment is, uh, well, I'll tell you, it's ozone and uh, bacteria-activated carbon contactors, and that deals with the organics in the lake. But when it comes to us, we need to be able to say, okay, water can go to 10 of these 12 trains and make our 400 million liters so that I can clean two of them at a time. So we break them up into trains and it gives us that redundancy. So these two plants serve approximately 1 million people, that being the population of Mississauga. But right now we actually have way more water than we need on this site and we're able to sell it to other municipalities. So we're making a lot of water in Mississauga right now. So here's a couple quick shots of the membrane cassettes uh, as they are. So we, we actually have a crane that lifts them up. And, uh, and there you see all the little modules plugged in here. And then this is a, a newer one. So you can see, I don't know if you saw, we're able to see on the, the overhead earlier, but we had those sort of like uh, pipes that came up the top. And that's them connecting to all the modules on the back there for permeate. So I said we also do wastewater. So the great thing about membranes is the footprint reduction that we get in our wastewater treatment plants. So in a typical wastewater treatment plant, we've got our influent coming in, so our sewage. We have screening, 
We have primary clarification. Uh, we have our bioreactor going here that could be um, separated into many different zones. Then we have our secondary clarifier whose job is to return the solids, the biology, back to the bioreactor to conserve that biology and then clean permeate going out of the top. And that's basic sedimentation um, physics right there. Then you have maybe a, a, a fining stage on the other end and it goes out. But this whole process is huge because you've got, you guys would have covered sedimentation already. So you know how large a vessel you need to make to get a good separation of a very, very concentrated solid solution. Well, we don't need to worry about that when we use membranes. We can actually bring a wastewater plant down to 25% of its size in terms of footprint from, uh, from a clarifier setup to a membrane setup, making the same amount of water. So we can save a lot of area by using membranes and we can operate them at higher solids rates. So on a plant that I worked on about a year ago, they were operating at about 500 ppm solids and we're up to 1200 ppm solids right now, uh, just based on the fact that our membranes can handle it and it's, it's working out better for their reactor. So that's what we have right here, fine screening. We have our bioreactor. You might see it shown as a, a separate bioreactor than a membrane basin, but it's essentially the same thing because the membranes are just an extension of your aerobic zone in your bioreactor. So when we make a, a bioreactor, we have our fibers that go into modules, go into these larger cassettes. I was saying that we have new stainless frames, and this is the sort of non-supported fiber here. We just have the, well, the fibers are supported, but the actual module is not. They go into this larger cassette and into the membrane train. And we have, uh, we've covered this really, but we have our reactor, we have our membranes, and we have our permeate. And like I was saying, we can reduce our footprint of the plant to 25% of its conventional activated sludge footprint down to, uh, to the, uh, the MBR footprint. So like, like most things, we're trying to fight a land conservation. We're trying to get the most bang for a buck in terms of what space we're taking up. So that's where our MBRs really help us out. And this is an example in Italy. And I like this example because you can see both happening at the same time. Here's a clarifier happening, or clarifier setup happening on one part of their plant because they didn't retrofit that, but they did retrofit one part of the plant as the membranes. So here is the membrane facility, and here is a not exactly equal, but almost equal capacity in terms of water purification from their two clarifiers. So you can see the very, very stark difference in footprint size. So how do membranes work? So you don't just stick them in and pull a vacuum. You actually have to take care of them a little bit. Because while you're, especially in vacuum operation, while you're pulling solids against these membranes, you're creating a cake. So you're fouling it. So as you're pulling these solids, you're sucking them onto the membranes, clogging the pores, and creating resistance for flow. So while we're permeating, so water's going into the membranes and up through this header, where they're all connected to, going out as permeate, we also have to aerate the fibers. So the purpose of aerating the fibers is to create shear along the membranes and to knock off that solids. There's other things we do to clean them which involve chemical treatments to dissolve the solids, to break down organics, to bring um, inorganic phalanx like calcium carbonate hardness into solution and get rid of that from the membrane surface to unfoul it and to create an easier permeation path. But the big thing is that we have to aerate them. So when you're doing your aeration design of a membrane, you have to consider bubble size, their shearing effects, and how much money you're going to be spending on aeration. Because one of the biggest money sucks in a wastewater treatment plant is the aeration. You're spending thousands of dollars. Well, actually, I shouldn't say thousands of dollars. It depends on the size of your plant. You're spending a lot of money on your, uh, on your aeration. So we want to try and reduce that. And GE did try to reduce that about a year ago. Two years ago, it hit the market. And we're just starting to see projects come out with a new type of aeration. So we used to just have diffusers on the bottom of the tanks that would give us a constant aeration flow. But what we've done is we've turned it into, and this one actually shows it a bit better. So this is our old aeration where we just have small air bubbles going up constantly against it. We tried to reduce the aeration demand for this style of aeration by having two paths to the membrane, so half of the membrane was aerated at a time. So you'd have one airflow rate, and you'd only, or sorry, you'd only aerate half of the membrane every 10 seconds or so. So you'd go back and forth cyclically. And you get these really tiny bubbles, which worked well. But it was a 
very large air consumption. And while they were switching back and forth, there's a period of inefficiency where you're running the blower's inefficiency and you're not getting the good shearing effects that you want on the membranes. So we commercialized a product called, they call it Leap MBR, and it's a more efficient aeration product. And what you get is these huge bubbles coming up right here. And they're actually just a bubble cap. So if you can imagine, um, well, a bubble cap, any, anything like that, you basically have your, your air coming in here and it fills up a bubble cap on top. As that pressure rises and rises, eventually the air just leaks out the side and you get a very large bubble. And what's great about this is as this bubble moves up, it creates a, a wake behind it and that gives us great shearing effects, which maximizes the effect of the air on the, on the membrane, removing solids and uh, helps keep them a little bit cleaner. So that's basically all I had. So I'll take any questions. Yeah, so that's something that uh, I don't spend a lot of time with. It's what our research group spends day in and day out doing, but it basically depends on what the composition of the dope is. So you actually, when you're dissolving the polymer particles, like I was showing you earlier, uh, the chemicals you put in there to dissolve the polymer and to create the almost, uh, we'll call it like a slurry of polymer that we're using then to cast and to extrude the membrane, whatever is in there, the, the chemistry of that is gonna, is gonna determine our pore size and the uniformity of the pore size, and, is, and largely the, the pore size itself, also on the flux rate of that solvent going into the non-solvent phase. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah? How much of what you learn in your undergrad do you actually use? Use on a daily basis? Um, the fact that I'm thinking about it should tell you something. <laughs> uh, I'd say uh, a good portion of it, um, but that really depends on how you apply yourself. It's really easy to ask people how something is done. Um, I work in a large organization with a lot of really intelligent people. So I could very easily just sort of take the, the easy road and sit back and wait until someone answers my question. Or I could try and apply some of the things that I learned in school. Um, obviously separations, great class for what I do. But um, much of what I do uh, also comes back to fluid dynamics. Um, I'm looking at piping systems most of the day, trying to find out why we're not hitting flow rates and and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I think chemical engineering gave me a good background for what I'm doing right now. It's the best. <laughs> yeah. Is there a way to operate the MBRs like anaerobically or anoxically or something? Yeah, you can. Um, so we do uh, aerobic MBR. Um, we can basically put membranes in an aerobic or an anaerobic state. They don't really care. What they care about is the shearing effects of bubbles. So if we were to maybe recycle a methane stream from our anaerobic uh, bioreactor or like a nitrogen stream or something, although that would get kind of expensive, we could create the same shearing effects of air against the fibers to keep them happy and to reduce the caking. But um, yeah, we haven't done an anaerobic bioreactor yet, but we are putting one in. Um, it went through the design phase and I'm not sure when it's being started up, but in, I'd say within the next year, we're gonna see our first anaerobic uh, MBR go into effect, so. I mean, the, the difference between your aerobic and your anaerobic MBR is that, you know, in a very simplified state, an aerobic MBR is bacteria of almost any sort put inside a waste stream from the sewer after it's been, you know, filtered of all the, the trash, and then you just aerate the junk out of it, and it grows, <laughs> and it eats your organic. So that's a very simplified understanding of it, but it's really easy to maintain an aerobic MBR versus an anaerobic MBR, which has really tight constraints on chemistry and, uh, and pressure. Yeah. How many people in the, uh, so you're not in the research division? No, no, I'm, I'm in the commissioning division, so I travel around and I start up plants. So how many people would you say in your area versus those that are in the research and the design area? Uh, you know, I really don't have a good answer for that, but uh, I imagine quite a lot because we have, in terms of who is in the Oakville office, there are uh, maybe you know, two dozen people uh, working for that research group, 
but we have research partners all over the world. We have our manufacturing facility in Hungary that has other skilled researchers over there. Um, I'm not sure of any university partners that we, that we work with, but uh, I imagine there's few more people than I just see on a regular basis in our Oakville office. Okay, so the Canadian branch is about 25, 30 people? Um, in terms of the, the group that I see, yeah, that would be the people I would see in the Oakville office, but I, I really don't know how far it, it extends. I mean, we have a research partnership with a government organization under the Skyway. There's a, the Land and Water Filtration Research Center, so we do a lot of work over there, and I don't know how many of those people are GE employees. Um, if, if any. So I, I imagine that our research arm stretches further than I'm able to see. <laughs> okay, so question two on the midterm is going to be a... <laughs> cool, okay. Well, if there's no other questions, then that's it. Thank you.